Once the initial spurt of reforms was over, the pace became more gradual, sometimes even painfully slow. That perhaps is in keeping with the Indian philosophy of incrementalism. Today, this issue of policy changes is once again the subject of intense discussion. And cynics are now talking in terms of a Hindu rate of reform. <coughs> what has been the unfinished agenda, the unfinished agenda on economic policy? I've tried to identify seven major themes. Firstly, the growth story has been somewhat narrow. It has bypassed agriculture and allied activities. Consequently, we have 65% of the population living in the countryside with the sector contributing only about 14% of the GDP. This is responsible, clearly, for the supply-side constraints which have been pronounced in the last few years. As a result, the high inflation, which is now sticky and structural, not merely cyclical. In the more extreme scenario, this could lead to social tension, which we as a nation can ill afford. Incidentally, Gujarat deserves praise for its management of the rural economy and the agricultural sector, which has provided a second string to the economy of Gujarat and made growth more sustainable. Secondly, infrastructure is proving to be a binding constraint in the movement to a higher trajectory. There is a deficit of power, a gap in port handling capacity, constraints in surface movement with the roads not being of the desired level and quality. The involvement of the private sector and of late public-private partnership model has helped but not adequate. In the energy sector in particular, the policy-induced distortions impinge substantially on the availability of coal and gas. Thirdly, the financial sector and the tax regime has not moved fast enough to support a vibrant real sector. <coughs> the net result is that the cost of money is prohibitively high. Inflation no doubt has a major role to play in this regard, but it's also compounded by the inefficiency of the banking and financial system. On the taxation side, the desirability of a unified common market in the form of a pan-India goods and service tax cannot be overemphasized. Studies show that other things remain constant. The GST itself will contribute 1% plus to the country's GDP. Fourthly, the reforms of the last 20 years have almost completely bypassed the land and labor markets. No doubt, both are sensitive from the socio-political point, but they are also critical from the economic aspect. A more forward-looking perspective will be required if the country has to compete with the Southeast Asian economies, let alone the developed industrialized countries. Fifthly, the new India is blessed with a demographic dividend of younger people who can contribute handsomely to the growth story. But meaningful contribution requires relevant and upgraded skills. The common refrain from various groups in industry and services is that they do not get people with the skills they require. It is in that sense a case of water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. We have millions of people, but they need to be skilled in what they do to be useful and to contribute and add value. The central government has in response started an ambitious national skill development program which between 2007 and 2022 over a 15 year period hopes to provide new skills or upgrade the skills of 500 million people. The unique feature of this 
is the reliance on the private sector to substantially deliver this target. Sixthly, while the so-called license raj substantially ended with economic reform, the resource raj, the term used by Professor Raghuram Rajan of Chicago, is alive and kicking. This came to the fore in the allotment of spectrum in early 2008 by the telecom ministry and was evidently a manifestation of phony capitalism. Attention has since then been focused on this in the political and civil society space as an instrumentality of corruption. I had the privilege last year of chairing a high-level committee to make recommendations to the central government on the allocation and pricing of natural resources. In the limited time available to us, we looked at the key areas of coal, mining, petroleum and natural gas spectrum, and to some extent at forests, land and water, since these are uh, basically state subjects. The main thrust of the recommendations was that it is necessary to immediately move away from an opaque system to a more transparent system of allotment, with the price by and large being determined by market-determined processes. This, we believed, is not only necessary to ensure that the state gets the intrinsic value of what it is giving away for commercial exploitation, it is also necessary to follow that route to raise the bar of credibility in the eyes of the people at large. Most of our recommendations, I am told, have been accepted. We are now to watch the implementation. Lastly, there is the critical issue of the overall governance, architecture and institutional credibility. <clears throat> this is something which was considered peripheral to law. No longer so. No one can precisely identify the mix of reasons why some countries do well than others on the economic matrix. But one thing stands out, and this has been recorded as empirical evidence in a very recent book by two professors, one from Harvard and one from MIT, called Why Nations Fail. And the hypothesis that they put forth with evidence is those that those countries and economies do well, which have better political institutions and better economic institutions. And those that don't have good political <coughs> and economic institutions, in fact, they use the word extractive political institutions, and therefore it translates into extractive economic institutions. Those countries do not do well. And they have studied this across the world over a long period of time in history. I would recommend that book to those of you who are interested. So basically, good institutions and the sound governance have a positive correlation with rapid and sustainable economic growth. Let me now turn very briefly to the role and function of economic regulators. Essentially, Regulation is the prerogative of the sovereign. However, as good practice, the government has been setting up statutory regulatory bodies for enforcing rules and regulations and providing the credibility of a level playing field in sectors which were hitherto reserved for the state and have in response to the liberalization paradigm opened up to private investment. Hence, the string of bodies such as SEBI, CERC, and later the state level electricity commissions, TRAI, IRDA, ERA, and so on. More such regulators for coal, mining, real estate, etc., are proposed to be set up. The experience so far has been generally good and invested the decisions of the regulators with a fair degree of independence and credibility. However, it is important to provide them a framework which affords genuine autonomy. Basic to genuine autonomy 
is financial independence, which will protect them from ministerial intervention. Effective parliamentary oversight, yet minimal, minimal executive interference in the affairs of regulators, is widely recognized as the mantra for success in this direction. The quality of regulators is equally critical. The selection process needs to be distanced from the line ministries and kept as independent as possible, preferably under the oversight of the senior judiciary. This will ensure that the selection process brings forward the best talent and minimizing the possibility of what is called regulatory capture. Ladies and gentlemen, having covered the economic landscape with broad strokes, let me turn to competition policy and law. Competition policy broadly interpreted to include policies that enhance competition in local and national markets. It is said to be, and maybe somewhat grandiosely, said to be the fourth pillar of government's economic policy, along with fiscal policy, monetary policy, and trade policy, trade policy including industrial policy. As for competition law, it is a legal instrument designed to prevent anti-competitive business practices by firms. Effective policy and law thus are an important constituent of a good regulatory and business environment. Competition, which is essentially the process of rivalry between business enterprises for customers, is a fundamental characteristic of a flexible and dynamic market economy. By responding to the demand for goods and services at lower prices and higher quality, Competing businesses are spurred to reduce costs, <coughs> increase productivity, make investments in innovative products and processes. As a result, both economic efficiency and consumer welfare are enhanced. <coughs> the process of competition is, however, not automatic. The, the Chicago School which is wedded to the laissez-faire philosophy, would have us believe that markets will regulate themselves. But perfect competition is as much a mirage as the perfect wife or the perfect spouse. Vested interest groups, large monopolistic firms, and other stakeholders tend to distort the process of competition. This happens not only in emerging economies, but also in advanced industrial economies. Hence the need for a robust competition law. This, is, this has been in the last 15 or 20 years, the flavor of the season across the world, with about 120 countries having put in place competition regimes. In a sense, India was among the first developing countries to have a competition law in the form of the Old Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act 1969. That act was enacted on the recommendations of the Monopoly Inquiry Committee, which reported that there was a high concentration of economic power in over 85% of industries at that time. 